welcome to episode 24 of Andromeda. Some wars are coming to a close, others are just beginning. Ermor's message from Russ details his struggle against the Hinnom Kalem Alliance, but he does seem pretty confident that he can keep the territory that's around his capital. He's also telling Ermor to take any of his territory over by Saramadia because Hinnom is going to take it otherwise. Uh, Ermor raided this province here with just some mercenaries. I had no issues with that. He also checked out, I guess, the amount of PD on this province by pinging it with a commander who <laughs> did not successfully retreat. And this is the more interesting battle of the turn. Ermor's invading a province with some mercenaries. Strumsa the war elephant. It's a funny name for an elephant. I guess he's the leader of this band of mercenaries. He's managed to convince a few guys to ride him and has a whole bunch of tentacle foul spawn that follow him around. And these ones are kind of interesting. They're the amphibious variety of foul spawn. And you know, they do have six attacks per square. They're armor piercing, but they're stacked are just abysmal. Pretty, uh, pretty goofy band of mercenaries here. I saw someone comment that his, for, for his head cannon on this that this is a uh, this is a circus that fell out in hard times. Had to become a cell sword or cell tusk. But it wasn't PD that they ended up raiding. It's a whole bunch of Oyarpadas on the flanks of a group of long dead. So what is for dinner? Uh, foul spawn is for dinner. See if this elephant manages to do. Nope. <laughs> I was gonna say maybe maybe we could do some damage to the Oyapadas, but that thing vanished instantly. Poor Strumsa. But yeah, Ermor did nothing to Saramadia's forces here. Did kill a couple of province defense. Uh, spring floods bothering Ermor in both games. <laughs> Whoa. People dug up something funny looking and they're worshiping it now and nobody's looking. Uh, nice. A uh, positive resource event on the capital. Those are always good. Worth the uh, little bit of population dip. Uh, Ermor is aware that a solar eclipse is coming. Can be useful information as I do believe he has spirit sight on his bless. Yeah, so he might be able to use that to his advantage if he times it with an important battle, though he doesn't have too much going on in this region at the moment, unless he starts another war, say, with Hinnom. He found a magic site with arcane probing, impossible angle. I wonder what that looks like. I get maybe just an archway. Well, I've seen plenty of those. It's not impossible. And did just reach evocation four and is continuing to evocation five, but these spells aren't entirely relevant. Netherbolt, Banefire Dart, and Bolt of Unlife, though I don't think he'll be using the mages that can easily cast these in his front line at the moment. At this stage in the game, they're kind of a little too valuable for like sight searching and research and things like that. And since he doesn't have a lot of research goals met, they're not as powerful on the battlefield than they will be later on in the game. So it's better to have, you know, things like these moving around. And I'm not sure if he's using these. I'm, I'm not sure why he has these over here. Maybe just for some sight searching infrastructure, things like that. He does seem to be moving in, kicking his feet up on the couch, chilling it. Uh, he will be storming the castle next turn. That's going to decide whether or not at least at the moment he will get Saramadia's capital. Uh, I very, very strongly doubt Saramadia is going to be able to do something about this. And he's got one of his air random elders on Alquil duty, so he will start getting some research ramp, though uh, he doesn't have a whole lot of air gym income at the moment. It will be limited. It'll be a big deal once he reaches construction six, though, then he can start turning these fire gems into lanterns. Quite a ways off, though, and he has a lot of goals to reach before he gets there. Uh, evocation six. Oh yeah, he's looking at some powerful stuff down here. Flame eruption is pretty hard for him to pull off. Uh, Astral fires has a pretty good area of effect, so in many instances it is a good spell to cast. Blast of life turns things into soulless when they get killed, so in some instances it can be a minor force multiplier. Bane fire is a pretty powerful spell. One of the, one of the few spells that really punishes blood bond bless with how much damage it does in area of effect too. But the biggest one I think is wailing winds. This spell is really effective in causing enemy armies to rout. And on top of that, he will be going up Thaumaturgy for, you know, Soul Slay, Enslaved Mind, things like that. Oh, Saramadia, what's going on here? Greetings, our Enduring Hydra friends. I, I don't really think Saramadia is Enduring. I mean, I guess they are still around. Technically, they are. Yeah, sure. Letting him know that Russ is having a problem with Kalem. Uh, I don't think it's just Kalem that Russ is having a problem with. Though I don't think really would have noticed until this turn. But he hasn't been too affected by Desertion yet. I lost, I think, three units overall from it. But this is it. It's now or never. He's moving all of his forces from Dragon Scale Mountains onto his capital, and at the same time, he's breaking siege with everything he has. <laughs> or not even everything he has. You know, I think maybe this turn was a little bit sloppy, maybe. I imagine he's not caring too much about this game at this point. Yeah, it happens. But yeah, I, you know, at least to do some damage to somebody, I'd really like to be involving these fire mages, summoning some small fire elementals. These would at least maybe take away a few of his sacreds. 
make them just a little bit harder to chew up. But yeah, I think in general, it's not a matter of whether or not Sarmadia is going to be able to maintain his capital. It's more just how much damage is he going to be able to do. And we will see next turn. Now there's a very different situation going on on Caleb's side of things. Had a successful raid against actually a decent amount of PD. I think at 15 PD. Good demonstration of why it's generally not good to dump PD. In most instances, it's not really going to make a difference. Like, Caleb only lost two Spirehorn Warriors here. In turn, Caleb lost a province to one of Russ's armies. And these two battles are a little more interesting. This here is Russ attempting to push Caleb's sieging force off of one of his forts. Uh, Caleb shot here against the vastly superior sacred troops that Russ has is to take out Russ's commanders, which Russ is adjusting his script. To his credit, Russ is starting to adjust his script a little bit. He's got his commanders spread out, so they're now all clustered in the middle, and he even has this uh, this priest here standing in front of his skin shifters, which is pretty funny. Could end up uh, potentially getting land strikes, not careful. Let's see what Caleb manages to pick off here, if anything, and oop, completely misses Russ's commanders, so now he just gets absolutely chewed up by bears. And these bugs, you know, definitely aren't helping out. They're not they're not adding much, but it is an extra layer of defense for Russ's commanders. Russ only loses a single skin shifter in that fight. And look at all the damage that he's done to Caleb. And he did lose a lot of ice clads here. These are a little less replaceable than the Spirehorn Warriors, chiefly due to their resource and recruitment costs. But this is generally what it's like to play Caleb, and is why it's really good to stick to economic damage before you have your major research goals online and your army set up to use them. And another battle here in the Forest of Eden, where Russ has a little bit of Lizard PD and some adventures from his event. And Kim hasn't brought an enormous amount to this, though the Iceclad are definitely formidable in the Cold Protection 19. And we'll see if this played out any differently than in the original battle. So the Lizards walk up thinking they're fighting something other than birds for some reason, and then boom birds completely fly over their heads and kill Russ's healers, and <laughs> in this fight a couple of his ventures past that, but then get completely cleaned up by these lizards who, you know, in the end do have two attacks. They are really powerful units, at least offensively. Their protection isn't the greatest. Their defense is slightly below average. So Caleb gets routed here. In the original battle, he only managed to kill two of the adventurers, not all four of them. I do imagine it was the healers. We'll have to check up on Russ's turn, as those are the ones that were in the back, while the others were scripted to attack. Or I don't think they were scripted at all, but which means they're, you know, going to move forward into melee. But good example of, you know, at least decent effective use of Swarm when it comes to counter rating. Swarm can significantly boost the effectiveness of PD. But Calum, unfazed, is continuing on with his mess of arrows, big long red arrows. He'll soon be raiding this swamp here. Bit of a predictable move, one that Russ could intercept if he wanted to. Though, you know, there's only so much Russ can do, especially when this army is uh, looming in the distance. Calum is raiding Forest of Eden again, this time with pure iceclad, jumping up into Falgoth here and is recapturing the troll woods with a huge pile of Spirehorn militia. He's also forming up a fairly sizable army here on Visian Forest. This thing is scripted to go. Uh, that's a lot of, you don't really need to give these guys air gems for this fight. Though, you know, mages do sometimes like to cast elementals off script. Might not be that bad. He's not even using his full script though. You might want to. You might want to have him cast more Thunderstrike because a lot of times they won't even cast it off script due to its fatigue. Oh yeah, it would be really interesting to see this army move up against Russ's <laughs> magic duel. Hilarious. Funny. A little bit risky I think with this mage, but he is more likely to come out on top of it against Russ's mages who are Astral 1. He's also using Storm twice. It doesn't work. It's not, not necessary, even if it did work. But it's not bad to have a couple of Eagle Kings along it with any army. So yeah, we'll see where Russ is moving. We could end up getting a pretty big battle next turn, depending. One that I would be very interested in seeing the results of. Helheim is receiving some compensation for the the bump they had underwater, though nowhere near as much as the province is worth, which is more than 100 gold a turn. Not to mention all of the gems Helheim spent on forces for raiding the province. I think really he should have just gone with a thug raid from the very beginning. He has the paths and the gem income for amulets of breathing, so. Damn, 22 blood slaves in one blood hunt, just one commander blood hunting. That is super good. Oof, hurricane on Helheim. A pretty decent population hit, actually. Oh, that's a bummer, but he does have the growth scales to patch 
match it up. Oh, also, this worldwide event here. This is just luck one for everyone from the uh, Throne of Fortune that got claimed by, I believe, Rilia. Okay, there is some interesting things going on here on Helheim's turn. He is moving some scouts, but mainly he's moving this... Actually, this is, at this point, you call this an army with his prophet and all of these hell hearings into Ermor's territory. And up here, this is this is the big tell. Raiding party, raiding party. I think Helheim is almost certainly about to attack Ermor. Like, <laughs> potentially just a, a turn or two too late to save Saramadia. Though I'm not sure if he really cares all that much. Man, he's, you know, this could be really bad for Ermor. Though this does also have the potential of blowing up in Helheim's face. However, he can't, you know, just sit by and do nothing while Ermor gets huge, gets a huge economy, huge research lead. That's really dangerous, so the sooner he acts, the better. Forging a lot of research equipment and a bit of thug equipment. See, he does have some uh, Hellcarls coming up. I'm not sure if he's using them for research. I think he'd use Van Heerses for research. Maybe he's using them to thug. I'm not really sure. I don't have an enormous amount of Helheim experience. I would generally not want to recruit the Hellcarls over the Van Heerses. Maybe he's doing it for reanimation. That that might be what's going on, because he is casting it already with a Hellcarl, and he does <laughs> have a lot of death income. So Siege Chaff, yeah, actually, no, now that I think about it, maybe Siege Chaff is what's going on there. I, I do like the disses, though. Fortunately, they're capital only, so, you know, you can't get as many, but these things are awesome, but specifically because of the flying, I think, and the air path is decent for thugging. But, yeah, I wonder how uh, sophisticated Helheim's elf coverage is going to be before he makes an attack. A lot of times with nations that have very effective, stealthy raiding parties, like Helheim, sometimes you might see them cover, like, like five to ten provinces at least in an alpha strike which can be really devastating when a nation isn't expecting it at all and can be enough to beat them in a war so pretty exciting development i think oh, okay not over 100 gold i guess it depends on the uh the scales that are on it as well as who owns it yeah he's got he's got more raiding parties this one's hanging out up here i presume he'll be moving it down as well oh well, I mean, yeah it's stealthy I mean, i'm not sure why he's not sneaking this Maybe he's worried about something happening to this province for some reason let's see anything happening from Atlantis. Oh, wait, hold up. Oh, I mean, he might be moving here because of this message. I don't think this is the one where you have to patrol out the uh, the false prophet. I think this is just kind of a one-time thing, so maybe that's why he's moving an army there, or quote-unquote army raiding party. Now, Russ, wow, look at all these battles. Damn. Uh... Russ's message from Ermor is basically, you're on your own, buddy. That's the gist of this. Pat on the back, good luck, you got this. But Ermor does not want to protect him or anything like that. Did hit Conjuration 3, which is a very important research goal for Russ. Now we know how the battles against Kalem went. What we don't know yet are the Hinnom battles. In Habathria, Hinnom has raid against PD. Once again, a demonstration that 15 PD, it's just, it's not worth the gold. That's a lot of gold. That's like, what, almost 100 gold worth of PD? More, yeah, this is more than 100 gold worth of PD. Uh, just dies to eight Dawn Guards. It's not worth it. Heavy Cav PD too. And here's Hinnom's main army moving against the same amount of PD here in Dumna. The other two battles are more interesting. Now, <laughs> I'm gonna have trouble not being biased whenever this guy's involved in a battle. Attica the Melkart writing just a small amount of fish PD. Let's check him out. He's gonna go through his uh, his little script here, Astral Shield, resist magic, and he's on hold and then attack closest. Bam, Mace of Eruption and Vine Shield in action there. These fish are not gonna be able to do anything to this this guy. He's so swole, so handsome, muscular, tall, beautiful. Reminds me of somebody. So it does just fine against five PD. Will be interesting to see it go up against larger amounts of PD or even small armies, though the skin shifters are pretty scary. And I was pretty excited to see this one here. Uh, this is this is Russ's quote unquote raiding party. I mean, this, is, this isn't bad, you know? Skin shifters are fucking nasty. And he's got his profit here too to zap whatever. Oh, the Rune Smasher, though. Oh, that is a shitty thing to lose. Two penetration, you know, that, that could be used for battlefield assassination in the right hands with the right script, though. This is just kind of a silly shield. This is where uh, Ham's got a little bit of province defense here, not much, but then he's got his Horite Shaman, who is coming back here to do some more Dago summoning. So this is what <laughs> this is what Russ has to deal with here. Bunch of Dagos with sleeping potions on a stick, though it looks like the PD is moving out ahead of time. We'll see if the 
doggos get any action here. Yes, they do. Look at that. 159 fatigue, 140 fatigue. That is what these things, that's what these sleep vines do. Put things right to sleep and let things like heavy infantry, or, you know, these things do some damage too, just start tearing stuff up. So Russ lost his profit, though I think he kind of wrote it off over here as it was cut off from his main territory. And he now only lost a couple of doggos, which he can replace in a single turn, more than replace. Uh, he did find a decent pile of nature gems and rest. I almost wonder if this uh, these events are meant to go together. I'd have to look it up in the inspector if it would show it. I almost wonder if they're uh, a little bit glitched, like, you know, like, oh, we found three nature gems, and quote-unquote found, and then you find out that it's because some uh, some troops were digging around in a witch's house and got cursed, but there's no, like, this many units have been cursed message, so I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe it's just a coincidence, and he had two nature gem three events on the same turn in the same province. Also killed a dumb bird that was flying around. And yep, sure enough, right as he reaches Conjuration 3, he is doing a double casting of Bear Summoning, which means just like that, he's going to have 14 additional sacreds, and sacreds that are decently powerful. Uh, pretty big old bears. He is also doing some... Call of the Winds casting on province 78 and 64 over here. This is going to summon some birds that are actually fairly effective against a small amount of PD. It's basically like a, a remote raiding party. Sometimes it's all right. I usually don't like spending the air gems on it, but you know, Russ has to do something to distract Caleb as his armies are a little bit smaller in number, though vastly more powerful, at least uh, in relation to Caleb's raiding parties. And this is interesting. He's had enough of messing around with Caleb over on this side. Maybe he's a little bit spooked by all, all of these units potentially forming up here and wiping out his army and he's like all right it's Hinam's turn and he's moving right into the middle of Hinam's territory with this army. Damn, what's he doing with these? I'd really like to see him put this assassin to work. You know, maybe he doesn't realize it's an assassin. I'm not sure. But this thing can kill commanders, you know? Could potentially do some damage to uh, to Hinom because Hinom doesn't have a lot of commanders that are capable of leading this big army. If it, if it manages to match up with that commander and not a mage, that could be really devastating for Hinom. Stop this army cold in its tracks. It's like at least stealth the guy so he's not you know getting freaking muted not that it matters to uh to him <laughs> an assassin that can't talk is actually kind of cool but yeah russ is definitely going to stick around so long as Kalem doesn't figure out a way to deal with these armies right here these sacreds are going to be a little bit difficult to deal with without a good ground line to hold them up and allow them to get any you know, like air evocation and now he's just going to start going crazy into bears with mother oak up he's going to be getting a lot of bears that's going to be a huge pain i'm just kind of thinking of this from Kalem's perspective to be a huge pain in the ass. And I think defeating Russ is going to have to depend largely on Kalem and Hinom working together, if it's going to happen. And speaking of Hinom, things always look so cozy for Hinom. A uh, failed casting of Dark Knowledge, and I think he's just getting wolves to uh, patrol for blood hunting, which is going decently. He found nine blood slaves among three blood hunters. Could be a little better. And we know about these battles. A uh, really good event here. Found a dead dragon, steeped some water gems out of it, and made some dragon scale mail. Some cold resistance and a morale bonus, not bad, though the protection isn't incredible. Uh, in exchange, you know, it does have a uh, pretty low encumbrance. Not quite as good as the dawn armor on the milk carts, but you, you never know. The cold protection might become relevant. Uh, it looks like he's going to have another army over here forming up on Sonria. What he's forming up for on this side, I'm not sure. Maybe he was thinking about fighting with Uramor for, you know, I wouldn't be. Yikes. Need a lot. Well, he does have a lot of mages here. Damn. I just want a, a little bit more research. I, that actually looks about right for even considering that smart vacation. Yeah, I'd want it, I would want a decent amount of research before thinking about that, at least personally. But I, you know, I think no matter what, he's going to be turning right around to deal with this army right here. Uh, I'm imagining this temple up here is done for in Black Peaks, and he's continuing to raid over here, and Russ isn't likely to have any more territory over here after this. And he's moving a mage and a priest over here onto Giant Spine for some infrastructure once this fort goes up in a turn. So yeah, Hinom seems very in control of his current situation. Will be interesting to see how he reacts if Hinom does end up invading Ermor, he might become involved in that war. Though you never know, he may become involved in that war in a way that I'm not expecting as much, say, invading Helheim. And Atlantis is, <laughs> him and Caleb have just been exchanging gems like crazy. A lot, lot of friendship between these two nations, at least in the last few turns. Ten water gems from Caleb. And there's just a province income event. And did reach Conjuration 5, which is an important research goal for underwater warfare. Uh, unfortunately, Atlantis did stale this turn. Not the best turn to scout. Man, look at this 
minion. Ooh. But yeah, not the best turn to stale on. He did at least have a repeat recruitment checked on a couple of his first. Oh, wait, never mind, not in this one. On his capital, he had a repeat recruitment check though, so it's not a complete waste of turn in that regard. But that's a lot of research that isn't happening. And he's also not going to see Kalem's nice message with the water gems. But yeah, he does have 110 Rillian units sieging this fort over here. So I imagine he will be responding shortly now that he has Conjuration 5. And oof. He didn't have anything queued up past Alteration 3, so this other research is going to go right into Conjuration, which, you know, isn't the worst thing for it to go into. And Rilia, uh, these gems right here from Ermor, these are from their trade agreement. Rilia sent 20 pearls to Ermor, expecting 20 water gems, but Ermor wasn't able to give him the entire amount, so he sent 10 of the astral gems back, along with 10 water gems. And they received 40 water gems from Saramadia. Saramadia saying that he's pretty much on his way out, and he's giving something called a uh, death basket. A bit of small, it doesn't contain everything that Saramadia has. But sometimes when a player uh, is losing in this game, is about to lose, they'll give a big pile of gems and sometimes magic items and gold to a uh, another player who's been nice to them. Called a death basket. So here you go, buddy. I'm dying. Mess them up, especially the people who messed me up if you can. I really did just reach Thaumaturgy 3, though there's not an enormous amount going on there for him as far as the war goes. And he's actually moving all of his forces off of this fort here, so it's not looking like he's wanting to raid this right away, which honestly I think might have been the right move to uh, try and get these units over here and siege this down before Atlantis responds, because this fortress is right on the front lines and could potentially, the recruitment from this could potentially decide the war. However, you know, really his recruitment, I mean, is questionable. Like if he had the fort, he might just recruit more uh, guardians for his slave guardian train he's got going. Choo -choo. Uh, damn, yeah, he's getting a lot of Lobo. It seems to be a strategy. Lobo guards, mine lords, and slave guardians. Interesting composition. But, you know, with Atlantis staling and being a little bit erratic as he has been, like, it really, uh, you know, I've, I got a bad feeling for him, you know, just with this slave guardian strat. It's kind of what I see as a misallocation of resources. Losing all those units to Hinom, uh, moving kind of strange. I mean, he does need a raid. I just don't think he should necessarily move all of his siege chaff off while raiding what is probably like what five or six pd maybe maybe 10 out of whatever the land is putting up here it's like damn he might be able to take it with just his uh, slave princes but yeah i would actually say that at this point with uh we'll have to wait and see what atlantis scripts are like i definitely think if atlantis scripts properly he will have the advantage in this war but we will have to wait and see how it goes that has been turn 25 of andromeda uh, looks like helheim who has previously not been involved in any wars might might be starting one soon with the big daddy. It will be interesting to see. It is possible he will do some attack designations next turn, and I will see you there.